So, glad you're here. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them up. We're going to be in the book of John, chapter 15. John, chapter 15, as we sort of land the plane on this series we have entitled Retuning, wherein we're looking at the call of God on our life as individuals. We're looking at the call of God on our lives as a corporate entity called the church, and we're asking ourselves, are we in tune? with what God has for us. And so week one of this series was number one, understanding what God desires from us. He says in Matthew chapter 5 that we are, as believers, salt and light. The only question is, what type of salt and light we're going to be? And so if we understand who He's made us to be as individual followers of Jesus Christ, but more importantly, corporately together as a church, we are like salt and light in that world of the time, indispensable. In fact, it's where we get our vision statement from. Now, our mission statement as a church is to be a Spirit-directed church, discipling people to know Jesus as Lord. We believe that the Spirit has directed us to this particular location in Ashburn, Virginia, to make a difference in the community He's called us to. That's our vision, to be indispensable to the community God has called us to. And so, in this series, what we've been trying to do is look at Matthew chapter 5, and then just asking, are we lining up with that? Are we being the salt and light? Are we being indispensable? And, and we started all that in week one, and in the next three weeks, this being the third of those three weeks, we're looking at principles, things that can help us be more effective, salt and light, be more effective and be more indispensable. We said in week two of the series, week one of the three principles, that we're to be giveaway people. Mark chapter 10, Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Here's our model of living. We're to be people who are giving away our lives and trusting him to provide for us as we show the world who he is through what we do and how we act. Last week, Pastor Lee was here and talked about this idea that God's desire when he looks at us as co-heirs and how he sees us, he sees us as partners, not just participants. And I think many times in life, When we talk about being together as a group of people, we misunderstand what it means to be a partner versus participant. I love that little example that Pastor Lee gave. One was a partner, the bacon, the pig. The participant was the chicken, just gave an egg. When we look at that idea, it's like God is calling us together to be more than just showing up and doing good things, but His desire is for us to partner together to accomplish what He wants us to accomplish through the power of the Holy Spirit in us, which leads us to where we're going to be this week. But before we go into there, I want to revisit a moment I can in my own life a long time ago in a faraway place called Ohio when I was in high school. Now that gets harder and harder to remember the older that I get, but there's some things that never leave your mind, not the least of which was my experience playing on the basketball team my junior year. Some of you may look at me and go, you played basketball? Yes, which might explain how bad we were. (laughs) I remember near the end of the season, we were awful. Our coach recognized we were down, recognized we were hurting and that sort of stuff, and he did something at the time that just felt like coach speak. He said, hang in there. Don't give up. I promise you, if you stay together as a team and work together as a team, it will be worth it. He also said, but it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> well, worth it in that year was 2 and 19. We didn't win our first game to 10 games into the season. We were awful. And he had to say that, not because he just wanted to stay together, but he understood the truth of it, because next year with pretty much the same team, we weren't amazing, but we went from 2 and 19 to 13 and 11. Same team working together. But he knew he had to speak into our lives because in that moment we were ready just to stop because it was painful, it was not fun, and there was no joy whatsoever. I don't know if you've ever been on a team that's been that bad. I don't know if you know what it's like to go 2-19 and in a sports competition in a league, but I bet a lot of us know what it's like to go 2-19 and in other places in our life, right? And we've had those moments where other people, like pastors, things like that, stand in front of us and say, hang in there. It's going to be worth it. Trust me, it may get a little harder before it gets better, but but hang in there on this difficult thing. And so when we think about what they're asking us to do, we think, oh, I get it, That, that seems good up here, but my experience 
in those circumstances. Well, it's been painful. It's been no fun. It tells me a different story than it's worth it. And because of that, we struggle. If you've ever had that moment in your life, I want you to know something. Today, I get it. Especially around what we're going to be talking about. Because sometimes in my life, when we talk about this third thing that we believe God has called us to be and to do, to be indispensable, I'm still mentally there. Yet I want to ask a question. Here it is. When someone calls us into something that's uncomfortable and difficult and challenging and our experience has not been fun... If our temptation is to, to stop and not do it and to push past and understand it's going to get better and we stop, what if we stop and we're wrong? What if I'm wrong? Not emotionally, not you wrong emotionally about the pain or the difficulty or the lack of joy and the hard experiences that maybe have happened around certain things. But what if the person asking us to step in isn't a coach in a long time away, long time ago in a faraway place called Ohio. It isn't a pastor doing it, but actually it's Jesus himself asking us to step into something that's uncomfortable and hard. What if we concluded it's not worth it, and it actually really is, and we don't try again? Or if I say this, what if we're missing out on something greater that Jesus has for us? Do I have your attention? I hope so. Because here's the final principle that we want to talk about when it talks about being indispensable to the community God has called us to. You ready? We are better together. Now, when I say better together, I'm not talking about let's all get together and let's have a tailgate party. Don't get me wrong. Love myself some tailgate parties. They're great. That's not the way that I'm talking together. I'm actually not even talking about we are better together when people gather physically in a room or gather digitally. We are together. But it's possible, believe it or not, to be surrounded by hundreds of people and still be isolated in an individual. Amen. We know that. Some of us right now are like, yeah, I'm in this room. I'm online. I feel that way. When I talk about the fact that we're better together, the word I want to draw his attention to is this, the word community. But now, when, even when I use community, I understand that we all bring our own definitions of what that word means. And so when I'm talking about community today, here's what I'm talking about. This is, it's, a, it's where your story, your life is known, it's shown, and it's grown. And this is the key in the context of biblical love. And so this morning, as I hope you're there already, in John chapter 15, we're going to dive in again, and we're going to look at this section of Scripture that, that maybe you're familiar with in the upper room, John chapter 15, 16, 17. John chapter 14 is Jesus in the upper room. And we're going to begin to understand Jesus' call implicitly for us to be better together. And I want to be honest and transparent as I always am up here, and I hope you know that, is that this one for me, more so than many I can think in a long time, is much easier to preach than to live. So the takeaway this morning is not what we know. But are we going to step in and live out what Jesus asks us to do? John chapter 15 is a section, a whole chapter, all about relationships. Relationship with Jesus, relationship with each other, and the relationship with the world. And in the first 11 verses, there's one of the famous I am statements in John where he says, I am the true vine. What he's saying is, I am the source of power. I am the source of life. And he talks about the believers, the followers, us as branches and says, we need to stay connected to him, Jesus. But once we get to verse 12, he begins to transition away from that relationship to Jesus. And then he begins to talk about this relationship that, that we should have to each other. And this is what he says in verse 12. This is my commandment. 
this is what I command you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Then it goes on to say, greater love has no one than this, that someone, someone lay down his life for his friends. I don't know about you, but I've engaged moments before where I feel like everybody else in the room knows what's going on but me. Have you ever, have you ever walked into a context or a, an environment or whatever it might be, and it seems like that everybody else is in on what's going on, and we're a little bit on the outside looking in. You get an environment where they're acting, behaving, and, and you want to connect, but you can't. Why is that so? Well, because when we enter that environment, we often lack context. It even happens here. This morning we're going to participate in communion. But when I say the word communion, while a lot of us in this room have this concept of what communion is, it is the physical representation of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us some 2,000 years ago when He gave of His body and His blood, He paid the penalty for our sin and rose again victorious over sin, death, and grave so we didn't have to. We understand what the Word is. However, one of the things I love about Christian Fellowship Church is we come from all different sort of backgrounds. And so that means that when we enter into this place, contextually sometimes, we don't exactly understand how we do it. And this has recently come to my mind of just how much I live in a context without talking about things that are just assumed now. For those of you who are veterans of Christian Fellowship Church, means five years ago, just yesterday, it struck me that five years ago was our groundbreaking for this place. Seems like yesterday, but it was five years ago. And there's a whole lot of people who are here this morning who were back in the old building and knew exactly how we did it, knew our context. There's a whole lot of people who God has brought to be a part of our community since that. And I realize that we every once in a while do this thing where we provide communion at the end. And the best way I could describe it is, is you come in, you grab the communion elements when you're ready, and you take them when you're ready. I don't even talk about that lots of times anymore. Until, I don't know, a couple months back, someone came up to me and said, hey, could you help me out? Like, sure. He goes, the communion thing that we did today. Like, yeah. You never told me when to take it. Like, you went to announcements, it was almost over, and I'm still holding this stuff. And I realized, oh, context, right? They were newer. I failed to explain it. I failed to get it. So by the way, if you haven't noticed, I'm doing two things. I'm giving an illustration and I'm explaining this for later, all right? (laughs) But context matters. Why? Because when we are coming into something new, many times there are things are assumed. Now, fast forward 2,000 years. Not just out of a moment, but out of a complete cultural context. And I want us to understand the context then. Living in a communal way, right? Because there's an unspoken assumption of what Jesus is saying here. Living in a communal way 2,000 years ago was assumed. The ancient culture rarely said be in community. You know why? Because they couldn't survive without it. Right? They didn't have to come and say, be community any more than I shouldn't have to come and say, if you're going out in public, please put on pants. We just kind of know that. Right? It's what we do. And so, when we look at Scripture, it was already clear in that context that people were better together. So, the focus on Scripture many times is not so much be in community, but rather it was assumed you were in community. And then when Jesus talked about it, when others talked about it through the power of the Holy Spirit as they were inspired to write parts of the New Testament, what they focused on was because you're in community, this is how God desires for you to live inside of that community. Now, fast forward 2,000 years ago, and we can miss this, right? We miss things fast forwarding five years ago from another building. Now is such a different time. I mean, have you thought about how busy our lives are? Our lives, more than in any other time in history, are filled with individualism and our own view of things. For many of us, we can functionally go through a complete day and beyond that without ever having any significant, valuable connection in community to the world around us. Some of us love working from home. 
because you don't have to have significant, valuable connection to the people at work. Now, if it's a commute issue, I get it, but I mean, think about it. Sometimes the, the, the depth of our connection to people is an email. That's a deliverable. What I'm trying to say is, is that the ancient world could have never, ever imagined this. We are people that often has nameless interactions. Much has changed since Jesus' time. And here's how it's changed. We rarely stop, we rarely collaborate, and we almost never listen. We don't. Now, for some of you who are very smart, you understand the deep theology of Vanilla Ice in the 1990s. <laughs> we don't do that. This is who we are as people. And because this is who they used to be, that's why we bring it up, because this is who we are. Because we won't see community explicitly commanded in Scripture. The closest you'll get is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28, where it says, do not forsake the assembly of people together. There is a call from Scripture that says it's important that we get together. Whether it's on Sunday or Wednesday or in a Bible study in our home, that we're supposed to be together. But again, that call to be together doesn't mean, especially today, that we're really living in community. We can be an individual amongst a group of people. But when we look and we see Scripture doesn't command it explicitly, it doesn't mean it doesn't command it because it's not important. It doesn't command it because it was assumed as a natural way of living. And we've got to deal with this tension that we today in 2023 often conclude community is a convenience and not a necessity. We do. So when we see these verses, we need to understand that Jesus was not giving the disciples, right, an out. We need to understand that just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not important. And because he didn't say in these verses first, be in community, there is no out in this because what is happening here is it's assumed it's there and he's beginning to define this. What does it look like? inside of this biblical community to live indispensable lives and the main priority in the community that God calls us to is this idea of love. Love one another as I have loved you. I think lots of us have, have been in communal situations that, that have not gone super well. And because of that it, it makes it hard for us to love, but not just love if we understand these verses. It's not just love one time and stop. It's to love and keep on loving one another. We could probably go through our own minds and, and take a look at some of the things that have happened in places that were supposed to be communal that didn't work well, and so we don't talk to those family members. We don't do certain things. Now, by very nature that you're here online this morning, I understand this might not apply to you. But research recently has showed us this. Since roughly 1995 until now, and it only accelerated during COVID, approximately 40 million people in the United States, in the United States, not, not in the world, just in the United States alone, have walked away from being a part of church. They've not necessarily in every occasion walked away of being part with Jesus. But being in the community thing, that's hard. I want us to put our heads around that number. When we see 40 million people, we need to understand over the last 30 years, more people have de-churched and walked away from biblical community, and many of them for very, very good reasons, than all the believers that came to know Jesus Christ during the first great awakening, the second great awakening, and every single Billy Graham crusade that's ever occurred. Why? Well, there's lots of reasons if you dig into the research, but, but one of them is, is that they came to this place expecting one thing, the church, and it disappointed. We understand that sometimes living out love in community is hard, but I also want us to understand this, is that when we see Jesus commanding here to love and to keep on loving each other, we will miss the mark if we think this is a command or a call for us to feel a particular way instead of to act a particular way. I don't remember when it was. 
But I think you can get some really, really good biblical theology when you're out at Target or Walmart. I, I'm probably Target. It's in my head. But you know when you partially remember a conversation? I was around a, a, a mom, I'm assuming, and a, and a kid in the cart pushing around. And I don't even know what the mom said originally. I, I don't know. I don't know. All I heard was vaguely the kid respond, I don't feel like it. Hey, you know what the mom said? I didn't feel like coming to the store today either. I didn't ask you if you feel like it. I told you to do it. How many of you pulled that line out before, right? <laughs> Can I say, though, I think there's a lot of times in my life I feel a whole lot like that young kid. For me personally, some of the greatest emotional pain has happened in a place where I should be having community. And I said I'd be transparent, I'd be open. You know what my, my temptation is? To say I'm out. Not out on Jesus, out on this whole community thing. Because it'd be easy for me to fake it and go, I can stand up and preach something that I don't have to live. Now for some of you, you go, huh, that's really interesting. We have a pastor that doesn't like people. See, I, I developed aversion to places where I would have to be vulnerable, even though God says we are better together. And it's not that I don't like people. I love people. You know what I don't like? Pain. I don't like emotional hurt. I've never once woke up in the morning and said, Jesus, this morning, may the community I'm part of be hurtful to me. Have you? Yet when I've experienced hurt, just like I know that you have as well, the temptation is to say, no, I'm not in this. And this is when it's hard. But here's another truth. Loving others and being in community is challenging even in perfect circumstances. It's not just when things are going well. And this is why, by the way, we need to understand that John 15 as a whole matters. The first step for us to being better together is to be connected to the first 11 verses in John chapter 15 where he says, I'm the vine. We need to stay connected with him. In John chapter 15 verse 5, Jesus says this, apart from me, you can do nothing. That means without first staying connected to God, living and walking with him, allowing his Holy Spirit into our life to challenge us and transform us, there's no way we're going to be able to live out a life that's better together. There's too many challenges, too many things that are going to come up in our life. And so we need to understand if we're to have a chance to live this way, we've got to first stay connected with Him. But then when we begin to step in a little bit deeper in community, this should be our focus. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than someone lays down their life for his friends. All right. You know, can I just say that the chances that one of us are going to be in biblical community with someone else and be required to physically lay down our life and die for them, the chances of that happening are infinitesimal. It could, but they're very, very small. And when we get real that way, we may begin to say, whoa, well, if that's so small, does that mean I really get an out clause on this verse? And the answer to that is no. Because the principle behind what Jesus is saying here is what we have to draw our attention to. The principle is this, is that sacrifice is the expression of love. Jesus' point isn't so much that we should die for others. His point is, is that love is expressed via sacrifice for others, not love is expressed via feeling for others. You say, what do you mean by that? Have you ever thought to yourself, do you think Jesus felt like going to the cross? Do you think he woke up one morning and said, I'm so excited today. But because he loved, <laughs> he went to the cross. And when we understand this, that the expression of love in community matters. This is the sacrifice. And, and one of the sacrifices we need to understand is that we often can't love each other well unless we know each other well. And that requires a sense of vulnerability to be known. Have you ever had someone 
do something very well-intentioned, even very loving for you, but completely miss the mark. And inside you sort of feel ungrateful, but you know they, they, don't, they don't know you. Kathy and I, a long time ago, had someone do something unbelievably kind for us. They took a picture of, of Kathy and me and they had someone commission a drawing of that picture and give it to us. It was at the same time, the most wonderful and useless gift I've ever gotten. Let's start by the fact that they didn't understand that both Kathy and I hated the picture that they got put into pen. Now, let me be correct. It was like most everything early on in our marriage. Kathy looked great in the picture. I looked like a gorilla, okay? <laughs> hated the picture. But if you really know us, you also know that the last thing that we're gonna do in our home is put up a framed pen art picture of us. That's not who we are. Does that make the thing that the person did unloving? No. Does it make that person unkind? No. It reveals a fact, though, that many times the depth of our love grows greater as we know people better and we're vulnerable. This is a, a premise that we're going to expand on some more, that knowing each other in community, showing each other, and growing in biblical community is going to take some sort of sacrifice on our part. Might take a sacrifice of time, energy, resources, maybe even our wills. When you came in this morning, it's also available on your online. If you're watching online, you got a paper that, that helps us grasp and understand when we say community, this is what we're talking about. We're defining it. We're growing it deeper. And when we get later on into this year, we're going to talk more about that. Today, I don't have time to expand on that, but I wanted to get in your hands. I want you to click on it. I want you to say, I want you to look at it. I want you to look at the scriptures behind it and begin to ask the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Because all of us need to engage in this way. All of us need to be in some place where we're known, we're shown, and grown. Because the truth is, we're better together. Yet, for many of us, we are stuck and we don't know how to be better together. So as we close today, I want to give you a couple quick things if I can. Things that if we're willing to do could help us. And the first one is this, we got to stop. I mean, I think without realizing it too often, we consider ourselves to be an exception to the rule and we think community can happen fast. We want crock pot taste in a microwave world. But that isn't actually how true community is grown. It requires intentional stopping. It requires intentional seeking out over time. Maybe, maybe, I'm not sure, but maybe in previous cultures and times it could have happened by accident. But can I say this? In a busy, crazy 2023 in Northern Virginia, true biblical community does not happen by accident. We have to be people who will make space for it. We've got to stop and evaluate. And if you don't know how to evaluate, the quickest way I would tell you is this. Look at your physical calendar, whether it's on your phone, your computer, or your old school and have it written down. What is it dominated by? Have you carved out the time that you need to do to find the things that God finds important? Because we won't stumble in. So for some of us, that's the first step for us in community. We, we have to stop. Here's the second one. We need to see connection as necessary. Have you noticed that we all really want community in the in case of emergency break glass moments? When there's sickness, when there's job loss, when there's all of these sort of things, immediately inside of us, we want people around us to support us, correct? We do. Too often though, that's the first and only time we actually think about being in community. Because somehow, we begin to see connection only as necessary when we can see a perceived need in our life. I think we struggle lots of times because we don't necessarily always see the logic. For those of us who want to make sure that they can set their goals and it's reached by a certain time, community doesn't work that way. And so sometimes we struggle because we don't like the immediate outcomes. We don't like how it feels. Or, if we're honest, some of us, maybe we won't verbalize it, we can quote Isaiah chapter 55 that says, God's way is higher, his thoughts are higher, he's got a lot. Yeah, but I kind of like my way of doing this. But his ways are not like our ways. Too often in our life, due to pain, due to busyness, multitude of other things, 
we feel as if we can be and should be salt and light, that we can be and should be indispensable, but we can do it on our own. Because if we're truthful, many times individualism is more, seems more effective and it certainly seems less messy. Now, we may not say that, but for a lot of us, our actions reveal that we're an individual playing in a team sport. You can look this up on the internet because you know if it's on the internet, it's got to be true, right? But Phil Jackson, who's famous for coaching the Chicago Bulls to six NBA championships, his most famous of players for him was the person who more often than not is said to be the greatest basketball player that's ever lived, Michael Jordan. But even the greatest individual contributor of all times had to have a conversation that went like this. You are great. You're better together. Until he realized what it looks like to work with others, he didn't win any championships. He won a lot of individual scoring accolades. He won all of that. And, and when I look at that and I think about that, there had to be this sort of change. If, if, if Michael Jordan wanted to get that elusive something greater that he wasn't, he was going to have to change. Now, here's where I want us to make a connection we might miss. Remember, there are three relationships that we talk about in John chapter 15. First, abide in Jesus. Two, love one another. But then when we get later on and we pick up in verse 18 to verse 27, it's talking about the relationship that we're having to the world. And there's an implicit need for community that we're better together because while we are called to be salt, while we all called, called to be light, while we are called to be indispensable, Jesus lays it out. Sometimes that's not going to be easy. He says, if the world hates me, they're going to hate you from time to time. It's going to be hard to go out and be salt and light. So don't miss the progression. He's like, if you want to be better in community together, you've got to abide in me. But if you want to be indispensable, you've got to abide in me and you've got to do it together. Because on your own, you won't reach something greater. Because of the challenges. Which brings me to the last thing. We need to listen to God. Now, I say this a lot, but it goes back to this idea of our mission to be spirit directed. God's spirit is in us. And if we live in a world where community doesn't happen naturally, if we live in a world where we're called to be indispensable and it's going to be challenging, don't we think it'd be kind of a good idea to seek out God's wisdom on where we should connect, where we should grow, where we should be known, shown, and where we grow? Especially if we've been hurt, especially if it's not worked before, don't you think we should go to God and ask Him, like, where to settle in? I, I know I need to do it. Because I can come up with a million excuses why not to do it, but I know if I go to the Holy Spirit, I ask Him to lead and direct me, no matter what internally the struggles that I have, if He says to do this, it's for my own good and His glory. And so the question that I want us to reflect on is this, is like, are you or am I in a place where actually we could say, yeah, my story is known, it's shown and grown in the context of biblical love. If not, what's stopping you? What if you're wrong? What if I'm wrong? Not about the emotional pain and difficulty, not about the hardness, not about the challenge of it, but we've come to the conclusion that it's not worth it. When Jesus says it is, What if by not stepping in or stepping in again, we're missing out on something greater that Jesus has for us? Because again, Jesus won't call us to do anything that's not best for us. We are better together. And so God made these words be words that we don't just speak, but that your spirit speaks in us. That we receive and we respond in the way it gives you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.